Um, so the three parts will be talking about Microsoft and SDL, uh, vulnerability disclosure, and the OWASP community. So the first part is what was happening over at Microsoft at this time. Show of hands, how many people remember this? All right, how many people were impacted by this? All right, there's not as many honest people in this audience. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Microsoft products in uh, 2000, 2001 were getting hit left and right by security vulnerabilities. Worms like I love you, Melissa, Code Red, Nimda. So this one, I love you, or the love bug was one of them. Um, Lovebug would email you a Visual Basic script file as an attachment to an email, which is executed on your computer when you open the attachment. And it abused a feature in Windows that attempted to hide file extensions by default. Um, so obviously, uh, the attachment would appear like a normal text file. Now, when the script was executed, it would make changes to the media files on your computer, and it would email itself to all of your contact list. Tens of millions of users were impacted by this. An estimated 10% of all internet connected users. Imagine that for a second. Now imagine the customer and revenue impact that it caused for Microsoft. There wasn't a ton of public security resources that existed at that time either. New classes of vulnerabilities were still being understood. So for this issue, it was basically folks on the Microsoft security team trying to figure out how to uh, uh, address this the right way as they saw the exploit variations emerge. Can you believe this is how far we've come from having 10% of the internet being affected by this worm? We're calling it cyber art now. So anyway, over the next year or so, Microsoft continued to respond to these issues and react to them while trying to figure out how to prevent them from happening altogether. In the January of 2002, Bill Gates published this memo about the formation of the trustworthy computing group at Microsoft. The goal was to address security issues in their products in a holistic way. It marked the beginning of a new era in software security. The memo talked about the need for investment in security across the company to build trustworthy products. Security, privacy, and availability were presented as foundational aspects of trustworthy computing. These foundational aspects have largely stood the test of time. For example, it said, security models should be easy for developers to understand and build into their applications. Users should be in control of how their data is used. In fact, I think that we as an industry are still trying to achieve some of these goals for security and privacy 20 years later. This paved the way for increased investment in proactive security across the industry over the next few years. A community of security defenders was starting to emerge. Over the next couple of years, Microsoft defined and rolled out the security development lifecycle program, getting buy-in from leadership across the company, and SDL became an integral part of how software was built at Microsoft. Now, the foundational goals were baking in security in all of the different software development stages. And as the program gained traction internally, they also made the SDL processes, tools, and guidance available for free externally as well. At that same time, as more companies were starting to build out AppSec programs, SDL became the basis for many of these programs. The security approach of the newly formed community of defenders was highly influenced by SDL approaches as a result. Now, the second part of the story that impacted our community in this time frame 
was the evolution of vulnerability disclosure. In the early 2000s, vulnerability disclosure was not easy for anybody involved. There was a lot of conflict around disclosure policies, vendor commitments to fix things, what is the right way to report something or fix something, uh, what is the right SLA. We as an industry still had not accepted vulnerability research as a positive thing that improves security. There was a severe lack of responsible ways to disclose a vulnerability. Anonymous zero days were being dropped. There were examples of researchers getting arrested or being retaliated against for pointing out security flaws in commercial software. This resulted in uncoordinated full disclosure of vulnerabilities that left critical systems vulnerable we still hadn't figured out the right ways to engage with the researcher community to drive the right outcomes for a more secure internet. They were still the bad guys. In the late 2000s, responsible disclosure started to mature and even become a thing. Companies started to see the value in engaging with the researcher community to improve software security. Things like researcher appreciation events were a thing for the first time ever. In 2008, at Black Hat, Microsoft announced that their vulnerability research program will also focus on improving the security of third-party products that were being used in their ecosystem in addition to their own products. And this included external vulnerability reports as well. All of this work later became the basis for the bug bounty industry to flourish. For things like Google Project Zero to come into existence. It changed our point of view on how we saw offensive security research on a fundamental level. The third part of the story was the foundation and evolution of the OWASP community. In the early 2000s, some folks were working on making software security more visible and increasing awareness around AppSec issues. As a result, OWASP was founded in late 2001. The initial goal was to make this information available to developers so that they can stop writing insecure software. But in the early days, a lot of the information that was being created was still focused on the pen testers. There was a lot of grassroots momentum in terms of creation of the content. So folks basically created and contributed content that they thought would be useful, things that they, concerned, they were concerned about. We needed to define things like attack components and testing frameworks so that we could all speak a common language about application security when we talked about these things. We were still democratizing AppSec knowledge and understanding of these different kinds of vulnerabilities. And new vulnerability classes were still emerging. Um, this grassroots aspect is still very much present in the spirit of OWASP today. Over the past few years, we've been trying to find the right balance between the strategic direction as well as that grassroots momentum in our community. OWASP meetups and eventually AppSec conferences started to become a great knowledge sharing forum as it gained more traction. And this helped grow the community of both the breakers as well as the defenders. You could go and read the OWASP top 10 um, and learn about the causes and defenses for common security issues. You could spin up Google Gruer or Webcode and use a proxy like Zap to learn pen testing. Over time, as the community continued growing, we refocused the need for developer relevant content, which was something that was one of the original goals but didn't quite land the first time around. This included both wiki articles and open source projects that helped fix vulnerabilities. Um, so the OWASP top 10 projects and stuff around defenses there and OWASP dependency check are good examples of this. 
all of this was still centered very much around making your developers security savvy. It still required developers to understand AppSec concepts and be aware of them and put the right controls in place to prevent against these vulnerabilities. Now, bringing these developers into our community did help us increase and grow the talent pool in AppSec. And it also helped us diversify that talent pool. But we were still focusing on teaching them security skills as opposed to leveraging their engineering expertise. So at the beginning of the current decade, around 2010 or so, our community included breakers who could now legally find security issues in uh, software products, defenders that now had the resources as well as the forums to share their ideas, and builders who were starting to learn security concepts and incorporate that into how they wrote code. So let's look at where we are today. In the past few years, we have revised our approach from what we called traditional SDL to what we are now calling DevSecOps. So we can support the deployment models of DevOps. Now, this has us thinking a lot more about engineering-focused approaches to embed SDL in this new life cycle. And we focus a lot more on automated security testing in a continuous deployment model. I'm sure you went to a few different talks at this conference yesterday that talked about that concept. And we're talking more and more about shifting left in our security approach, and traditional AppSec programs are starting to focus more on building scalable security solutions. In the vulnerability disclosure space, things are progressing pretty well as well. I think bug bounties are definitely a part and parcel of a security program today. More and more companies are investing in them. And bug bounty researchers are now an important part of our security community. This has also opened up so many more learning opportunities for folks that are interested in building that pen testing and offensive security skill set. In the OWASP community space, we have definitely grown a lot more from where we used to be. We have multiple events, conferences, and OWASP chapters around the world. We're doing an OWASP APSA Global event here today. And we have definitely brought in more developers into our community. And we're focusing our content, both at our conferences and our meetups, to be inclusive of this set of participants in our community. OK, so seems like things are pretty good today. Where do we go from here? Now, we have the breakers, the defenders, and the builders at the table. We have more diverse perspectives represented in our community today than ever before. How do we leverage and evolve this community to solve the future AppSec problems? In 2011, Andresine Horowitz said, software is eating the world. And that is a truism today. There is so much software being built that we are never going to be able to build a talent pool of AppSec professionals to meet the future need uh, of our industry. And our current approach of educating developers and bringing them into the security community is not going to scale. And if we continue to approach things the same way we have so far, we're going to lose. So how do we do this differently? First of all, we need to leverage the engineers that are already in our community to build security building blocks for common needs. In addition to the security testing automation that we're doing, we need to focus on building things like authentication, authorization, and secure storage frameworks that other developers at your company can use. These are basic security constructs, and everybody at your company shouldn't need to learn how to implement this correctly. 
and giving people these security building blocks to start from already addresses a lot of security problems that you would worry about as a security professional. The question that we should be asking ourselves is how do we minimize the need to educate developers about security vulnerabilities? We need to build more secure by default frameworks and platforms that are high leverage and help us scale. Tackling problems one app at a time, pen testing and code reviewing each application is a losing battle. As our tools become secure by default, we will be able to eliminate more classes of vulnerabilities. And the education burden then really will only become the awareness of the existence of these tools and frameworks. Our goal should be to make security more transparent to your developers whenever possible. Now, we talked about the builders that already exist within our community and how we should leverage them. But are there force multipliers that are missing from our community altogether? In the world of DevOps and cloud infrastructure, the definition of what an application is or what AppSec is, is getting more and more nebulous. The biggest high leverage wins for security are now in the platform and infrastructure services. These are the teams that are building tools that will be used by the rest of your company. So think about teams that build and deploy your CI CD tools, your change management and deployment tools, your container platforms, your project generators. This is where there is potential for scaling your security investment. Uh, one such example from my world that I wanted to share to make the point more concrete is Spinnaker. Spinnaker is an open source continuous delivery platform that is used by Netflix and uh, various other companies. It supports multiple cloud platforms in addition to AWS. And this is the tool that engineers and Netflix use to deploy their apps without having to learn all the ins and outs of AWS, because that is not a good use of their time. So it provides them features to be able to do application management and application deployment. So things like managing your cloud resources, managing your continuous delivery workflows, um, managing your pipelines, all of that sort of stuff is done in Spinnaker. So any security improvements that the AppSec team makes in Spinnaker cascades down to all of the engineers at Netflix. So if we partner with Spinnaker to make their default workflow secure, then that has a force multiplying effect on every developer at my company. Uh, one recent example of this was making sure that every time you set up a new load balancer using Spinnaker, it is always set up by default with HTTPS. Or making it super easy for developers to have an HTTPS certificate set up for any time they're spinning up a new service. Or making it easy for them to be able to set up app-to-app -app authentication every time they set up a new application using Spinnaker. So if there are folks at your company that are build building and deploying such continuous delivery uh, tools and platforms, they are the allies that are missing from your community today. They are the key partners that you need to leverage to scale your impact. The problem is we have traditionally not thought about that work as application security, but we really need to change that definition. This is the group of engineers that you should be educating about security concepts. Help them understand first principles of security so that they can be build these guarantees into their platforms and the rest of your customer base can take advantage of uh, those secure by default frameworks. This is where the next big win for security education is. Most times the goal for this, these type of central engineering teams is to provide tooling and frameworks that increases developer productivity. The security community really needs to understand and adopt that same mindset. 
How do we make developers more productive while staying secure? And expanding your AppSec community to include these platform teams will enable your whole company to write more secure software without even thinking about it. So think about how do you make your container platform more secure so you can limit your blast radius once an attacker does find an RCE in your app. Think about how do you harden your base AMIs that everybody at your company is using. Think about how you make secure storage solutions available every time a developer spins up a new app and they don't even have to think twice before having to you know, store a secret. And it minimizes the need for you have, having to write automation to manually or automatically search for those secrets in source code later on in the process. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't have what you described as a platform team at my company. That's fine. Maybe your company uses a lot of open source web frameworks or platforms, so your security win may be in contributing security features to that framework or to that platform instead of building and open sourcing a security project that you may present at the next OWASP conference. And obviously in this world, vulnerabilities don't magically go away. There will still be value in finding and fixing vulnerabilities. But now you can leverage the community of bug bounty researcher that's available to you to address some of this need. You can use bug bounty submissions to identify patterns and vulnerability classes that impact you the most and fix those in a holistic manner in your products. That is the true value of your bug bounty program. And sharing vulnerability research is a lot easier than it used to be. There is a lot of researcher blogs out there that talk about security issues that they find in real products. So you don't even necessarily have to rely on a web code or a Gruware or a juice shop to learn pen testing anymore. You can actually go test a real website to learn about security pen testing. Getting into AppSec from a pen testing standpoint has never been easier. I would argue this reduces the need for us as a community to invest more in content related to test environments for vulnerability identification. And we will continue to need this skill set in our community, but just in a different way than we have before. Show of hands, how many of you have attended a developer conference before? Okay. Um, in the last couple of decades, we have really focused on bringing developers into our communities and teaching them what we do. I think it's time that we participated more in their communities and learn what they need from us to minimize the burden of security. It's time we build security into the tools and frameworks that they're building, as opposed to building out an out-of-band solution that will later try to figure out how to integrate with their workflows. To broaden your team's per perspective on this, hire individuals from a central engineering background onto your team instead of your next security person. And AppSec is still a relatively new field, and we will continue to refine how we do this. It's very important for us to continue engaging with our community to share information with our peers in the industry. My biggest learnings have been by talking with people who have a similar security program as mine. This goes beyond talking about a tool that they open source or a successful initiative at their company. It's about the big picture. It's about the failures. It's about the overall investment. There is so much value in sharing lessons learned from those failures so that all of us don't have to make the same mistake to get to the same conclusion all the time. At the end of the day, we're all solving the same problems. The things you would learn from someone who's one step ahead of you in their security program is gonna be totally different from what you would learn from somebody who's at the same level as you from a maturity standpoint. Use opportunities like today to connect with folks that are in a similar role as yourself. Participate in your local meetups, your ISACs, your security communities. Information sharing is going to be very important for us to do this right and to find economies of scale in the process. There is a lot of learning left for us to do. And there's a lot of AppSec problems coming our way. And we need to change our approaches to scale for this need. 
We need to build scalable security solutions for our customers that are robust, usable, and secure by default. We need to broaden our perspective on who we think our community is. We need to leverage our platform engineering partners to scale our security impact. And last but not the least, we need to continue learning from our community and evolving our approach. Thank you.